Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. I'm Ken Leon, uh, Director of Equity Research and moder moderator today for our, our webinar, Mind the Midterm. Uh, with me is Dawn Yang in marketing. And <clears throat> Dawn, if you can move to the next slide. Here's our disclaimer. This presentation is for informational purposes only and is recommendation to buy or sell securities or engage in any investment. Uh, with me today um, are really three of our senior distinguished thought leaders at CFRA. Uh, we have Sam Stovall, who's Chief Investment Strategist, uh, Joe Lieber, Director of Research and Political Analyst at Washington Policy Analysis, and then we have Vincent Rondazzo, who's Head of Technical Market Analyst um, from Lowry Research. So here, <clears throat> for those who are not familiar with CFRA, um, we this is our history. It, it's a, a long history, but one where since 2016, the um, forensic business has merged with uh, S&P Equity Fund Research. Uh, we have had subsequent uh, acquisitions uh, in 2019, First Bridge for ETF data, uh, Lowry Research, uh, which is uh, Vincent's team, was acquired last year, and more recently, Washington Policy and Analysis um, rounds out a dynamic offering, largest independent research firm, and uh, this gives us the opportunities uh, to share with you our insights across different disciplines. Next slide, please. So this kind of gives a graphic really of, of really how CFRA does research and what goes on uh, inside the firm is a, a tremendous amount of collaboration, uh, access to data analytics and the ability uh, for our each of our teams to collaborate to come up with the best observations and insights to drive performance. On the left side you can see that we have a top-down as well as a bottom-up approach uh, to fundamental research. Uh, Sam leads our team um, and our thinking in terms of the equity markets and sector uh, weightings. Uh, Sam collaborates with our senior analysts uh, to really figure out what the analysts are thinking about bottom-up in terms of uh, each of the specific uh, industries or sub-industries. We also uh, put this together where that fundamental research discipline um, is part of our methodology for ETF research, uh, and we do have a very robust platform for both ETF and mutual fund research. The company research is really the legwork that is done by our large equity research team uh, covering 1,500 global companies and doing fundamental research and also leveraging the forensic research team, uh, which provides added insights uh, into the companies. All of this is also helpful on Market Scope Advisor for our model portfolios, which are available every day. And what I really take pride with our team is the bottom-up idea generation. Uh, very often, our best ideas for performance first comes with looking across industries in terms of thematic research. Uh, thematic research is on Market Scope Advisor every day. Um, it is more in depth research from the fundamental research team. Uh, all of this puts us in a position where we have a unique offering in the marketplace uh, that can be used by different market segments. Uh, whether it be wealth management, institution, corporate, or government. With that, let's move on to today's program. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Ken. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're going to talk about the equity markets and the upcoming midterm elections, what traditionally happens before as well as after. And as we see on the next slide, Dawn, um, if you ask somebody, you know, which uh, party in power tends to uh, be associated with the best returns in the overall stock market, 
the top left chart is the one that probably would be referenced most frequently that going back to World War II, uh, the S&P 500 has posted the, the best average annual return during a Democratic presidency when compared with a Republican presidency, up 10.6% for Democrats versus 7.1% for Republicans. Yet interestingly enough, if you look at it from a different perspective, think about who controls the purse strings uh, for the US government, and that is the House of Representatives. How does the market perform whenever the purse strings are held and controlled by Democrats or Republicans? And you can see that leadership uh, switches, that under a democratically controlled House, we end up with a gain averaging 7.9%, yet looking at uh, more than 250 basis points of outperformance whenever we have a Republican-controlled Congress. So just to show that that really sort of depends on how you look at something, uh, depending on what kind of story you want to tell. But let's take a look at the next slide because Obviously, people do think about whatever are the topics of issue, of uh, concerns uh, being brought forth by Congress. But at the same time, I know that investors look at the calendar. They look at seasonality, they look at cycles, and they know that there is a, a pronounced performance that's seen in the four year and 16 quarter presidential cycle. This table shows three things, average price change, frequency of advance or like a batting average. Uh, and then finally, volatility, standard deviation during each of those quarters as compared with all quarters or years in the presidential cycle. I highlighted in red uh, what we are just concluding. The second and third quarters of midterm election years tend to be the worst performers, uh, the only two of the 16 quarter presidential cycle that have posted declines on average. Not surprisingly, if you have declines in terms of average price changes, the frequency of advance or the batting average has been fairly anemic. The market has gained uh, only 50% in the second quarter, following only a 45% frequency of advance in the first quarter of midterm election years. Third quarter, a little bit better, uh, but still you end up seeing the frequency of advance fairly anemic for those two quarters. And then not surprisingly, uh, on the right-hand side, you see that the second quarter has seen an average volatility that was 28% higher than the average for all 16 quarters. And the third quarter was even worse, up 69%. Well, we saw that so far uh, in the month of October, uh, we have had a 50% increase in the number of 1% uh, days within the market uh, when you compare it with all October's going back to World War II. But with this bad news, typically tends to set up the market for good performances in the final quarter of the midterm election year, as well as the first half of the third year, mainly because the uncertainty surrounding the midterms has been lifted. We find that on average, we have a very strong performance, second best in the fourth quarter of midterm election years, up 6.4%. The best return is then followed up 6.9% uh, in the first quarter, and the third best return is then in the second quarter. Not surprisingly, also we see that the frequency of advance, the batting average, uh, tends to do fairly well also. We find that the market has risen 84% of the time in Q4, 89% of the time in Q1, and then 74% of the time in Q2. And we also see that the volatility has, has come down quite precipitously, up only 6% versus the average for all quarters in the fourth quarter of the midterm election year. But then volatility is 5% lower in the first quarter of next year and 26% lower in the second quarter of next year. So in the end, we find that the third year uh, has gained nearly 16% for the S&P 500, Average advance being 84% of the time with an average 28% decline in overall volatility, sort of indicating, well, you know what, maybe things uh, can look better uh, later this quarter and into this uh, 2023. Let's take a look at the next slide because a lot of people have been asking, yeah, Sam, but we're in a bear market. How might a bear market affect the presidential cycle? 
Well, each of the dates listed in the far left column are bear market years in which the bear market did not end by September 30th. So basically where we are right now. And we know that because the market did set an even lower low on October 12th. So what we find is that if you look at the, the blue area on the bottom where it says all, that essentially, if you look at all of these observations, um, the market was flat up only 0.3% in the month of October, and the frequency of advance was no better than a coin toss at 50%. Also, what we find is that the weakness tends to continue for the entire fourth quarter of the midterm election year with a decline of 1.9%. And again, a coin flip as to whether the market was up or down in that final quarter. Yet what's interesting is that we've had five of these years be midterm election years. And in four of those five times, they also represented an October bottom. And if you look at the returns and the frequency of advance during these midterm election years, the market gained an average of 5.6% in the month of October. Oh, interestingly enough, through last Friday, we were up 4.7%. The market gained six out of uh, these times, so 60% frequency of advance. For the final quarter, up 6.2%, very similar to the average gain during the fourth quarter of midterm election years. And in each one of these observations, granted, we're only looking at five, uh, but in each one of these observations, the market was higher in the final quarter. So while certainly not a guarantee that that will happen this time around, certainly offers encouragement to investors that maybe something good this way comes. Let's take a look at the next slide to say, well, what might happen in the coming 12 month period? This is a bar chart showing all of the midterm election years going back to World War II essentially saying what happened from October 31st of the midterm election year through October 31st of the third year of the president's term in office. And in each one of these observations, the market was higher with the average total return being very close to 21%. And because we might hear from Joe Lieber telling us that there is a possibility that the Democrats could lose control in one or both houses of Congress. I shaded those years in orange, indicating that even when we did have a change in congressional leadership, the market still rose and the average was 13%. Again, uh, history is a great guide, but never gospel, uh, but certainly very encouraging from this perspective. Issues that investors have to be dealing with, we can see on the next slide, uh, they tend to vary over time. But if you asked uh, a consumer, asked an investor, what are your primary concerns? They will almost always relate around the economy and healthcare. Uh, but specifically looking at midterm election years, I find that what we have right now in 2022, a tightening Fed, rising risk of recession, Russia's invasion of Ukraine to be very, very similar to what we saw back in 1990. The Fed was engaged in a rate tightening program. In 1990, because of the rising risk of recession uh, and that higher interest rate, like 2022, we were in a bear market. And back then we had Iraq invading Kuwait, uh, whereas this time around it's Russia invading Ukraine. So you can see that each one of these midterm election periods had issues that varied quite a bit, um, but some of them keep coming back to the economy itself, but still areas uh, of particular interest. Let's take a look at the next slide because some of these issues can then relate to the sectors within the S&P 500. This very busy chart simply shows the 11 sectors in the S&P 500 and how did they perform in each of these midterm election year through uh, the third year, meaning from October 31 of the um, midterm election year through October 31 of the third year, how did these sectors perform along with the market? Um, you show the, what I show is the percent change and then up. If it's a one, it means yes, it was up. If it's a zero, it means no, it was not up. Uh, and so we can come up with a batting average for each of those. And then the summary is on the left-hand side, the 11 sectors showing their average 
uh, total return combined with uh, the frequency uh, of advance. I shaded in blue those sectors that had the highest average percent change, consumer discretionary up 17.7, healthcare up 18.2, but tech uh, showing the best performance up nearly 30%, and a batting average that was unblemished. Uh, again, not a guarantee, but certainly an encouragement. And while the those sectors uh, highlighted in orange uh, represent those with the weakest performances, they were still pretty good, averaging anywhere from about 6.5% to nearly 12%, uh, and the frequency of advance being anywhere from two out of three times up to 88% um, of the time. So we see that the sectors, as well as the market, tend to do very well in that 12-month period once the uncertainty of midterm elections has been lifted. Let's go to the next slide, and we can see that the market tends to sort of figure out uh, how to make money, whether we have any one of these three political scenarios. A unified government means that the president and Congress are of the same party. Unified Congress means that you have both the House and the Senate from one party, uh, whereas the president is from the other party. And then a split Congress is, as it describes, where uh, one House in Congress is different from the other in terms of control. Now, not surprisingly, the market does the best under a unified government because whatever the president proposes tends to get rubber stamped by Congress, and that helps stimulate the economy, et cetera. Split Congress, well, <clears throat> they call that gridlock. And gridlock usually is pretty good. Uh, average 9.1% uh, <coughs> advance, excuse me, uh, during those years in which we have had a split Congress, with the best performance of all observations being a Democratic president in a split Congress environment, up 13.6%, the best of any of the other type of scenarios. I guess it relates to the old saying that if the opposite of pro is con, then the opposite of progress is Congress. And since Congress really are fighting with one another and nothing really can get done, Wall Street tends to favor that. So in summary, let's go to the final slide here and we see that yes, 2022 is what I call a sophomore slump year, the second year of the president's term in office, which tends to be dominated by lower prices and higher volatility. Um, near term, you know, we could end up seeing a near a, um, an oversold rally uh, that will benefit us possibly for the uh, fourth quarter of this year. I still think we have to deal with the uh, increasing possibility of recession and how much that will keep pressure on equities. Uh, but history typically says that uncertainty will ultimately give way to optimism. And maybe we find out that the low has already taken place on October 12th and that history will repeat in the coming 12 month period. But as Vincent will tell us when he talks about technical analysis, it's wise for investors to look for evidence of a bottom. Don't try to wait and pick a specific turning issue upon which you make investment decisions. So with that, I will turn it over to Joe Lieber who will talk to us about political trends. Sam, thank you very much. And I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. I appreciate it. Um, real quick, let me, um, before I get into the substance of the uh, presentation, let me just kind of go over where we are right now. Don, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, right now, the current House makeup is we have 220 Democrats, 212 Republicans. We have three vacancies. Uh, one is a very heavily GOP seat, Republican seat of a, a congressman who had an unfortunate passing in a car accident roughly six weeks ago or so. Um, so we're going to give that race to the Republicans, make it 213. Um, you need 218 seats to control the majority in the House. So if Republicans, if we say they hold 213 seats, um, they need five seat pickup to win the House. This is one of the smallest or the narrowest majorities we've seen in the history of the U.S. really. Um, and, and, and it's kind of remarkable that we've seen as much action being taken by this Congress, given these narrow majorities. The next slide, please. Um, the, the Senate, I think everyone knows the Senate, um, you know, it's a 50-50 tie. Uh, this, the 50-50 uh, tie here is what's made Joe Manchin of West Virginia so famous and, uh, and a household name now. 
Uh, and if everyone will remember back from their, you know, their eighth grade civics books, um, the vice president breaks the ties in the Senate if there's a if there's a tie. And so, given that, we have uh, nominal control by the Democrats uh, in the Senate with a 50-50 tie. Obviously, Republicans only need to pick up one Senate seat at net uh, to control the Senate. Now, what's interesting in my view about this election is it, it's been a very odd election, maybe one of the more the stranger midterm elections I've seen in, in my 27 years at Washington analysis. Um, it looked like at first this was going to be your traditional midterm election, meaning that, and I'll get into this a little later, but meaning that the, the party in power in the White House, especially when his approval ratings are, are bad, um, their party generally does bad in the midterm elections. And that's what it looked like. If you would have polled any you know, reasonable Republican or Democrat um, you know, before, let's say, the end of June, and I'll tell you why I'm getting, using that date in a moment, um, you, you would have had kind of unanimity that Republicans were likely uh, to win back the House and probably going to win back the Senate as well. And then uh, we kind of had what we call the Democratic bounce. So, Don, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, and on June, I think it was June 24th, but it was the end of June, we had the Dobbs decision. Just recall that's the, the decision that overturned Roe. Um, and this had a, a, a big effect in narrowing, narrowing the enthusiasm gap between Republicans and Democrats. Until uh, the Dobbs decision, there was a, a very wide margin um, of uh, in enthusiasm gap polls um, that Republicans were gonna show up at the polls in a much in much larger numbers than Democrats. And again, that's probably why, at least one reason why, you, know, you, you, you saw some unanimity among Republicans and Democrats that the Republicans were likely to win back both, both the House and the Senate. Also around the same time, uh, we had the January 6th hearings. We, we had those televised. A, a few of those were televised. Uh, if you look at polls from especially the independents, they really have a bad taste in their mouth for what happened on January 6th. Um, and that so that redounded poorly on Republicans in general. Obviously, then we had uh, this summer too, the Mar-a-Lago secret documents were discovered at, uh, at Trump's compound down in Florida. Uh, that didn't poll too well. And then Trump was out on the campaign trail uh, campaigning sometimes for candidates and seemingly sometimes campaigning for himself for the 2024 election cycle. And so what he started to do and what I think all this news of Trump and the press started to do was make this not so much look like a choice, a referendum, but a choice. Um, the party that doesn't control the White House in the midterm elections wants this to be a referendum, wants the midterm election to be a referendum on the president uh, and the president's party. Um, they do not want it to be a choice between the president and somebody else, this time you know, Donald Trump, even though Donald Trump wouldn't be on the ballot till 2024 if he decides to run again. But nonetheless, I think this also had an impact of uh, it, it, it encouraging Democrats to get out and vote, narrowing that enthusiasm gap like Dodd, Dodd, the Dodd's, Dobbs decision did, uh, and benefiting the Democrats overall. And then you know, this summer and in, in, in early in fall, we saw some legislative victories for, for the Democrats, the Inflation Reduction Act, which I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with, the CHIPS Act, which I'm, again, I'm sure you're familiar with, the PACT Act, which didn't really have anything to do with the financial markets, but helped out some, some veterans issues and then some, some, some gun legislation that was also passed. All of which was caused there to be a bounce in the um, Republican, excuse me, the Democratic polling numbers. And it looked like, hey, the Democrats are almost very likely now to hold on to the Senate, um, and maybe they have a chance in the House. <clears throat> and to kind of further this evidence, if you go to the next slide, please, um, we had some, we had five special elections that occurred um, after the Dobbs, uh, Dobbs um, decision. Um, in each of the five of these elections that you see here, um, the Republicans underperformed in each of these. That doesn't mean they lost each of them. Uh, the D and the R by, the, by there denotes the ones they won and the one they lost. They actually won three out of the five, but they nonetheless, even in those three that they, they um, won, they underperformed. And so I kind of like to do a little you know, game here. I, I, I say, let's say that you, know, you were a, 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 political, a, history, a student of political history and you had been in a coma for the last couple of years. And to me, this is what makes this election strange. You'd been in a coma for the last couple of years. You wake up and I go to you and I say, hey, uh, you know, there's been some interesting things going on in politics. Republicans have lost the last five special elections heading into the midterm election cycle. And your question to me may be then, oh, wow, did Donald Trump win re-election? 
was the president. Power generally does poorly in the midterm elections. I'd say no, 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 no. Actually, we had a Democrat elected in 2020, and it was Joe Biden. And you would say, okay, wow, so what did Joe Biden do? What did the Congress do to get his approval ratings up to the mid-60s? And I'd say, oh, well, 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 actually, Joe Biden's approval ratings stink. They're 42, 43%. And you might scratch your head and thinking, well, how the heck, if Democrats are the are, is the president and his approval ratings stink, how did Republicans underperform the last five elections, uh, excuse me, special elections? And you kind of go back to that Dobbs decision, January 6th hearings, Mar-a-Lago secret documents, Trump campaign visits, and kind of the, the Democratic legislative ratings. So that was kind of the way the elections looked Really, I think that last special election was in Alaska, which it was early September. And since then, and maybe you know, since October, since uh, since mid September, we've started to see a a a change into where this might look like a a more normal historical election. So, Donald, if you'll go to the next um, the next slide, please. So here, um, let me explain this chart here. Uh, the gray bars, I believe they're gray, they might be green, I'm a little colorblind, but the, the, the gray bars uh, show you the number of seats that the incumbent party uh, of the White House lost in the House uh, since 1946. So basically since the end of World War II. Um, and you'll see here that by and large, um, the incumbent party in the White House loses seats in the midterm election. Um, there are two instances here, which I'll go into in just a little bit, and that's in 1998 and in 2002. Um, in 1998, the reason given that the Democrats actually picked up five House seats um, was that Republicans overplayed their hand on impeachment. They hadn't quite impeached President Clinton at this point in time. They had impeached him in late December, but everyone knew they were getting ready to impeach him. <clears throat> and so we saw the Democrats picking up five seats and, and kind of defying historical odds. That was the first election since World War II when the minority party or the uh, majority party in the White House picked up seats. And then in 2002, George uh, W. Bush was still riding high off the kind of the 9-11 uh, issue uh, and, you know, the impending wars that we were going to have and, um, you know, American populism was, I mean, uh, was, was up and Republicans ended up winning eight seats there. Um, but just to note this, in both 1998 and 2002, President Clinton and President Bush, obviously of opposite parties, both had approval ratings in the mid 60s. As I mentioned earlier, President Biden's approval rating uh, is quite a bit lower. It's 42, 43, 44 percent, somewhere in that neighborhood, depending on the poll you look at. Um, and so it would truly, truly be a historical election um, if a president with such a terrible approval rating of his party actually picked up uh, seats um, in, in, in the House of Representatives. The, the black bars there are the Senate races. I don't really use historical data to, to predict, in my view, kind of um, Senate outcomes. As you can see, there's five different, different times in midterms where the, the Senate races defied uh, expectations or history, if you will, and you had the, the minority, the, the majority party uh, in the White House actually pick up seats. And the reason the Senate races are a little more difficult to predict from a historical perspective is we only have a third of the Senate seats up for re-election every year, so roughly 33 seats. And there's a lot of things that go into that. You know, are they red state senators that are up? Are they blue state? Is it a red state year, or blue state year? And candidate quality matters a heck of a lot more uh, in the Senate races, given there's so few of them versus versus um, the um, the uh, the House races. Um, so if you can go to the next um, slide, please. And so if you look here, the, if you look at kind of the the second to the last line here, the below 50% line, what this table here is talking about is when a president is below 50% in his approval rating in his first midterm, which is obviously where we find ourselves right now, Biden again, 42, 43% approval rating, it's his first midterm. Um, they lose on average something like, you know, 37 seats in the House. They lose something like five seats in the Senate, but I'm going to discount that Senate um, uh, loss just for a moment because I don't, I don't use history there too, too often. So, you know, what you could see or what you might should see from a historical standpoint are massive losses uh, by the Democrats. Um, and, I, you know, my view right now is I've got about a 75% probability the Republicans take the House. 
and I've got them probably winning. You know, if this would have been a few weeks ago, it would have been you know plus or minus 15 seats. I'm probably getting closer to the 15 to 20 seats, and probably closer to the 20 number. We'll see Republicans gain uh, in the House, um, and that's you know that's, that's going to make McCarthy Speaker McCarthy. If, if if Kevin McCarthy becomes Speaker, make his life a little tough. Uh, if he picks up, if Republicans pick up 20 seats. Uh, they need five to get the get the majority, so that gives them a 15 seat majority. He's going to have an awful lot of folks on the right wing of his party uh, who are not going to cooperate, in my view. Uh, some of the MAGA folks and some of the uh, Freedom Caucus folks, and it's going to make governing for him difficult, just like it did for John Boehner and Paul Ryan uh, with, with with regard to the Freedom Caucus folks. With regard to the Senate, uh, I've got a slight odds that that Democrats maintain control of the Senate. But if the trend continues over the last couple of weeks, I'll probably move that up to at least 50-50 and maybe even give Republicans the slight advantage in picking up the Senate. Um, the Senate's going to be extremely close. You know, there's close races within the margin of error, the polling margin of error in Pennsylvania, Nevada, Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, and Ohio. I could probably throw a couple more in there as well. Um, and, you know, you could have just a few thousand vote turn either way uh, in those races, and it could go from Democrat to Republican, Republican to Democrat. So, you know, you could see a big night for one of the parties um, in 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 um, in the Senate elections. Right now, I'm going to stick with the Democrats, but it's it's darn darn close. And then, Don, if you can go to the next uh, slide, please. Then I want to just point out this is Predicted.org. Some of you may be familiar with this website. This is a website you can go to today, right now, and you can put money on which way you think the the, the House will go. Uh, base and the Senate and different different elections. Um, so right now on predicted.org, um, the prediction here is is that the Republicans will control the House after the midterms. They give it an 80% probability, basically. Again, just to remind you, I'm around 75%, a little lower than they are. And the next one, please. The more interesting uh, number is the Senate control after the midterms. This literally just switched uh, about a week, week and a half ago. Um, it had been on predicted.org um, a you know roughly 55% probability that Democrats would would um, would keep the Senate after the midterms. They've slightly moved up to where they think Republicans will win the mid win the Senate after the midterms. Again, I'm I'm just under 50-50 on that probability. Now, one reason. Uh, next slide, please. One one reason it's tough, in my view, to be real confident um, in where you are in predicting these outcomes is because of the polling. And we've seen over the last three cycles or so, and I'm sure you guys are very familiar, aware, well aware of this, the polling has, has been difficult to say, you know, at, at, to say the, to, at, at best, if you will. Um, this table here, let me kind of explain this, this, this chart. Um, the red is where Republicans outperform their polls on election day. Um, and the blue is where the Democrats outperform their polls. It doesn't necessarily mean the Republican won or the Democrat won. It just is where they outperform. So I'm going to pick on about three states here to give you the example. Let's look at Maine. Maine is on that middle line, second from the left. Um, you may remember this race in 2020. Senator uh, Susan Collins was, you know, behind in the polls, I think, throughout the election cycle, almost the entire election cycle. And near the very end of the of the uh, election cycle, she was down by around six or eight points. She ends up winning by six or eight points, and so her net, you know, outperformance was about a fourteen and a half percent outperformance over the polls. If you look at the state just to the left of that, that happens to be Kentucky. Um, Mitch McConnell was never in really serious trouble last cycle, but the final polls had him up about nine percentage points. He ended up winning by nineteen points. So again, he outperformed his polls by about 10%. If you go to the far right of that of that column, or that row, I should say, excuse me, um, you have New Jersey. Um, Senator Cory Booker was up in the 20s um, in his polling um, whenever he, um, in his final polls before the election day, and ended up winning only by, um, I think it was 16. So he won, but the Republican outperformed by about, about 10 points. Now there's four races there where the Democrat outperformed, but, if the polling is as far off in 2022 as it was in 2020, and especially in favor of the Democrats as it was in 2020, I mean, the Republicans are going to do very well. They'll pick up, you know, it'll be 53, 47, something like that in the Senate after the elections. It'll, it'll be very good. And I don't mean to say, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. 
I don't mean to say that the polls in 2020, there was some bias um, for the for the Democrats on purpose. Um, you saw Republican pollsters as well as Democratic pollsters get the polls wrong. It's just that polling isn't getting any easier. It's getting more difficult in my opinion. Right, so go to the next slide, please. Um, so with, with all that in mind, let's just let's just you know think about what all this means potentially, um, at least you know, broadly speaking, what it means for the uh, financial markets. That's why we're all here, right? Um, so if we assume for a moment that we're gonna get split government and, and it could be the House flips and maybe the Senate doesn't, or maybe the House and Senate flips. I don't think there's much of a difference um, from, from these little boxes I'm gonna talk about if the Republicans control one or both bodies of Congress. Uh, and of course, obviously we're gonna have a Democratic president for the next two years. So, so what, are the, what, what might happen that might affect the financial markets? Well, a couple things here on the tax policy front, and also I can say on here, the fiscal policy front, uh, I think there's probably gonna be no real material changes um, on, on the fiscal policy front or the tax policy front. And, and to me, that even means if we, if we hit a deeper recession than maybe people are assuming, I think if we have divided government, we're not gonna see Congress coming to the rescue with some type of stimulus bill, given the amount of money that was spent um, over the last few years, given uh, the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis, if you will. So to me, we're going to have some changes in tax policy. We, we have to almost. There's some things that expire, like the, the R&D tax credit currently is on a five-year amortization, and you're not allowed to take the, the uh, um, R&D tax credit uh, fully in the year it was, it, it was expenditures were made. That will change probably next year. So there'll be some minor changes, but nothing that would cause you to go out and buy the S&P 500. Um, I think Sam mentioned this a little bit, gridlock. That's probably in the cards if we have split government. Uh, but even under gridlock, we'll do some things. I mean, I don't have a long list for you. And then, you know, I'm sure we'll, things will materialize as the year goes on next year. But one thing, for example, that will have to be done, most likely, is a farm bill reauthorization. That should benefit the likes of the, the, the farm complex and the likes of deer. Could also benefit the dollar general, the dollar trees of the world, as we'll probably, you know, throw some more um, food stamps into that legislation. But but that's something that needs to happen because it, it's the, the current farm bill expires on September 30th of next year and they'll need to do something before that uh, to reauthorize that. Two things that we might very well see that could have an impact on the market. One is the government shutdown. Um, right now we have the government funded through December 16th. It's under what we call a CR, a continuing resolution. And my bet is we'll have to pass another continuing resolution into Q1 of next year, maybe late Q1 of next year to temporarily fund the government instead of passing what we call an omnibus appropriation bill, which goes through September 30th, or the end of the, the end of the fiscal year. And I'm, I, my worry is, is given uh, Kevin McCarthy's likely very narrow majority in the House, Republicans in the House will, will do something that Democrats will just think is anathema. That is like, you know, increase defense spending by 12% and, you know, decrease non-defense discretionary spending by 4% or something. I'm kind of making numbers up a little bit, but I can see them doing something like that. That's not going to fly. So I think we have a real risk of a government shutdown happening sometime, let's say, uh, in March of next year. Government shutdowns usually don't have a big impact on the financial markets, although they have a bigger impact usually when we're in times of crisis or times of recession, which we might very well be in next year. And then the bigger one, I think, is the debt limit. Um, the debt limit is supposed to come up, roughly speaking, to get the best guess of it's all right now, um, early second half of next year. And Republicans are already talking about adding um, um, deficit reduction measures to that, spending cuts, and in fact, also talking about um, adding some um, um, entitlement spending cuts to that. And I don't think those will work. If they did, then my First box here, tax policy changes and fiscal policy changes. Maybe we will see some, some material changes, but I don't think they'll succeed in this. Um, but just like 2011, when we had it, when we came to the brink of a debt limit crisis uh, in July of 2011, we can see the same thing happening um, you know, this upcoming year, maybe the early second half of, uh, the, of, of, of next year. And then finally, just to point out regulation, typically when there's a split government, the, the White House, uh, the executive branch, focuses on, on, on regulation because they can't get a lot done. That second box gridlock takes over. There's not a lot that can get done. And so their, their agenda now goes to the regulatory function. And we should see a pickup in regulations um, from, um, from the Biden administration, which Washington analysis follows very, very closely. And then finally, next, uh, next slide, please, Don. Um, I just want to, you know, I'd be remiss every time I go out on the road and talk about 
the election cycle this year. I get a question about the 2024 presidential election cycle. Just a couple points about this. Um, the predict I put the predicted odds up there. They think a Republican's going to win. I think looking at what's going on today and what's going to go on in the midterm elections potentially is a terrible predictor about what might happen uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the next election cycle, the general election cycle. We've seen plenty of presidents get their party get killed in midterm elections. Obama's got killed. Clinton's got killed. But they nonetheless came back to win re-election fairly easily. I like to tell people, if you can tell me what the economy is going to look like in Q4 of next year when people are deciding whether to run for president or not, um, and in the first half of 2024, I'll better be able to tell you whether the Democrats are going to win the re-election or the Republicans are going to make the Democrats a one-term um, one term um, party. Anyway, I uh, will stop there and I will turn it over to Vincent. Go ahead, Vincent. Great. Thank you, Joe. Interesting insights from both you and Sam. And, um, and before I get started, just a reminder, questions from attendees can be sent via the chat box uh, on the upper right hand of your screen. So at CFRA, we find value in, in varied perspectives as pieces of the market puzzle. And the Lowry analysis offers just another piece of that puzzle, but from a different vantage when it comes to the midterms or really almost any event. So if we go to the next slide, please, Don. Uh, the Lowry point of view is that the law of supply and demand defines market trends, not necessarily events. So historically, market trends continue in the same direction in place prior to an event, regardless of whether that resolution was either, you know, quote unquote, good or bad or even unexpected. In other words, it's the dominant trend that shapes the market's reception to an event. So in bull markets, the trend is ultimately going to resume to the upside in most cases, and in bear markets like now, to the downside. The most recent examples in the context of politics were in 2016 and uh, 2020, the presidential elections there, when opposing parties took control. And because the underlying market conditions were still supportive of further upside, according to Lowry's primary indicators, the bull market was quickly reignited. We can see that in this chart. In the 2020 election, we saw that in anticipation of the election, the trends in Lowry's selling pressure and buying power indexes moderated, though buyers maintained their advantage with buying power above selling pressure ultimately. Uh, and for those unfamiliar, buying power is our longer term measure of investor demand while selling pressure represents the force of supply. Now let's go to the next slide. Uh, to examine the current conditions. As has been the case since late last year, the positions and directions of Lowry's measures of the forces of demand and supply are consistent still with the expectation of further intermediate term market downside. Selling pressure remains above buying power and that puts supply in control. These trends are pretty well established and uh, it, it's going to take some significant time and or effort on the part of buyers to reverse that. The next slide, we're going to cover another critical factor in providing context, and that is uh, market breadth. So market breadth suggests further intermediate term downside as well. Uh, in its most basic form, me uh, breadth measures how many stocks are participating in advance. And since it's just a running tally with no subjective interference from people it's actually one of the most reliable indicators of the market uh, trend and health many of these indicators these breath measures peaked in november of 21 and that demonstrated that most stocks had fallen into declines despite the continued rise in the market cap weighted price indexes right now all the uh, broad base advanced decline lines that are pictured here recently broke to uh, new bear market lows. And since breath, especially in wheat markets, typically leads price, this implies another uh, eventual leg down for stocks. But on the next slide, we'll go through the short term. And so for those more tactical, many of Lowry's short term indicators reflected, uh, reflect uh, elevated potential for a rally on the back of some oversold conditions that we had seen, uh, particularly at the end of last month and toward the middle of this month. 
Lowry's NYSC operating companies only 30 day net moving averages of advancing issues, points gain and upside volume. In other words, the building blocks of buying power had been in decline since mid August, but now appear to be reversing course. And, you know, typically when all three of these gauges rise above their 30 day moving averages, respectively, uh, especially after lengthy declines, a short term advance or, or more is likely underway. So while it's important to understand that investors using this signal would be trading against the primary negative trend, it may be helpful to at least acknowledge the greater potential for short-term gains. Also in the context of bear markets, it is impossible to forecast um, the duration or magnitude of counter trend rallies, but given that the long-term downtrend and its drivers remain in place, our focus remains on gathering evidence supportive of a market bottom without the ability really to gauge what that event or more likely confluence events uh, will be uh, to make that turn. So next, in service of that goal of identifying more than just a tradable rally, I'll highlight one of Lowry's long-term oversold indicators. Lowry's average power rating or APR index is among five most critical factors in confirming a high probability market bottom. Um, this index measures demand for more than 3,550 stocks to the Lowry database, which makes it uh, a preferred measure for both breadth and demand intensity. And more pertinent, you know, and historically, it's an excellent gauge of uh, long-term oversold conditions too. Since 1949, market bottoms have occurred with this reading at an average of 25, but as, as low as seven. So the most recent low is 34, and that was on September 30th. This suggests that while we're getting closer, the market, the market likely has further fall before truly committed buyers emerge. Again, this is just one of the indicators we look to build the body of evidence and conviction that a bottom is actually in. A recent white paper uh, that you can request identifies four other elements usually present at bear market bottoms throughout history. And, um, you know, like Sam said earlier, we were kind of echo those comments about looking for evidence of a bottom and trying uh, trying not to predict a, a turning issue or even a time frame to, to make that turn. So one of the key takeaways from the Lowry analysis, kind of to this point, and uh, our paper on bottoms is that although the environments greatly varied in the last 80 or 90 years, economically, socially, politically, the major bottoms shared many of these key market factors. And that that's, brings it all, all the way back to the market and what's going on with supply and demand. I'll wrap it up uh, on my summary slide now. The bottom line is that we'll leave it to those who have uh, an informational advantage uh, to determine what the specific impacts of the election might be. But from the perspective of our analysis, uh, it is the dominant market trend driven by the law of supply and demand that provides context for those events. <laughs> this suggests that notwithstanding higher probabilities of a relief rally, the dominant downside forces in place will ultimately lead to a continuation of that long-term market decline. Uh, to that end, we're monitoring key factors that would help identify a sustainable market bottom. But until then, regardless of the short-term reactions, patience and defensive measures uh, appear to still be warranted. Well, thanks everybody. And I'll hand it back to Ken for questions. Great, Vincent. And, and again, if you do have questions, you can post them on your screen in the chat box. And uh, here's a few questions. Joe, I'll kick off two or so with you first. Um, so, you know, if the House does go in the election to the Republicans and we're in a lame duck session, um, what, what will the Democrats try to get done for the rest of their term? Ken, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, there's a few things. I mean, typically, and you know, pun intended here, typically lame duck sessions are rather lame. Um, there will be a number of things that equity investors can be looking forward to, though, that might that might try to be attached or passed in a lame duck session. There's going to be four main bills they're going to look for. 
and that's passing four bills in a five-week session, which is what the lame duck session will be in the Senate, is extremely difficult. Many of these bills have nothing to do with the financial markets. There's a same-sex marriage bill. There's an electoral reform act that you know pr provides that the vice president count the electoral votes like he should. Um, there's a funding, a, a, a spending bill that needs to be passed, as I mentioned, at least a CR or an omnibus. And then there's a defense authorization bill. Um, and there's a few things they may try to pass. There's a lot of talk about trying to pass what's called the Safe Banking Act, uh, which would allow cannabis companies to, um, to be banked, something I follow very, very closely. I follow the cannabis industry for Washington analysis, one of my things I do. Um, I don't think this will pass in a lame duck session. I think stocks will run up in the lame duck session with the idea they might pass this. There's a lot of enthusiasm about them trying to pass it. I would also note that if the Senate does flip, one of the main things that, that um, Chuck Schumer is going to be doing in a lame duck session is passing or confirming judges and executive branch nominees because he knows if Mitch McConnell takes over, the Senate flips, those nominees are going to be slow, slow walk. And he's not, they're not going to get many judicial nominees through over the last two years of Biden's administration. There's also th something called Durban 2.0, which would negatively affect Visa and MasterCard. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about that in the financial markets, about this possibly passing in a lame duck session of Congress. Um, my financials analyst on this, Johnson Sala, is extremely low in his eyes that this will pass. And so the absence of that negative should be positive. Um, uh, for, um, for, for, for those stocks. So that's a couple of things that we're looking at in the lame duck session of Congress, Ken, that, and a couple of them that could have an impact on the financial markets. And, and Joe, as you roll into 2023, uh, the Biden administration, you know, with <clears throat> potentially gridlock, um, would you see more of the focus in your work, you know, related to executive orders or regulation you know, the regulatory agencies more than Congress? Yeah, and I let me, if I could go back to that first question, I left one thing out. The R&D tax credit, which I mentioned earlier, which would have a big impact for some defense companies. I think Raytheon mentioned in their earnings call recently, it's a $3 billion tax hit to them if the R&D tax credit doesn't quote unquote get fixed. That will also be attempted to be done in the lame duck session. I think that probably has to wait till Q1 of next year, but that's something that investors are also looking for. And then to your question, Ken, yes, um, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, when we see, uh, you know, gridlock or when we see the party, the, the, the president's party not controlling, you know, one of the two bodies of Congress or both, it's harder to get legislative done. And so the administration you know, starts to focus on regulations. The other reason they start to focus on regulations in the second part of their administration is, you know, over the last number of years, um, it's been difficult to get your executive branch nominees appointed. And you need your executive branch nominees to be appointed because they're the ones that are going to lead the charge on regulation. So typically it takes a while before those nominees get into place, you know, pick out the carpet and the um, wallpaper for their offices and get to work. Um, and we're still seeing vacancies in the executive branch, um, but they're getting filled and that will lead to more regulation in the last two years of the Biden administration, or I should say the last two years of the first term of the Biden administration. Great. Sam, um, midterm election year, different than than the others or, or anything that looks a little bit different or interesting to you this time, you know, for November 8th? Sure, Ken. Well, certainly uh, this is the first midterm election year after the uh, COVID uh, situation. So we know that COVID has turned seasonality uh, on end. Uh, we've also seen it uh, make a lot of changes to some historical patterns. So who's to say whether it's going to do something similar this time around? Also, we uh, prior to this year have never had the Fed start a rate tightening program in a midterm election year. We've had mm -hmm. higher rates in a midterm election year, uh, but typically we've seen higher rates start in the, the year prior. So uh, this is also having an effect. Um, but one reason is because whenever the year-on-year uh, -year percent change in headline CPI has exceeded 6.5% as it has now, <clears throat> uh, it has continued to rise um, and has eventually led to a recession and a bear market. Sam, for those on the call who also want to think tactically to the sectors, um, so we have the midterm election, we have seasonality, 
and then we have a recession next year. So when you put this all together, looking at November and December, uh, which sectors, you know, that you see or historically have outperformed going forward? Well, what I did was I um, put together in an article uh, that has been attached uh, to this webinar called Post Midterm Optimism. And on the bottom of the second page, I show the S&P 500 styles, uh, sectors, as well as sub industries and what it was their average percent change during the uh, 12 months after midterm elections since 1990. So, you know, not a, a lot of observations. Eight cycles took place over the last 30 years. Uh, but it gives you an idea that, you know, if we do end up having a, a similar kind of uh, jump after the slump, uh, that it's the higher growth areas such as technology and consumer discretionary that lead the way, where it's the more defensive areas that have held up quite well during the bear market and the recession that are still positive performers, but they just end up um, being underperformers on a relative basis. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, therefore, sub-industries that have shown the best results, and these were 33% or higher on average, were semiconductor equipment, footwear, electronic equipment and instruments, semiconductors, the chips themselves, home improvement, retail, communication uh, equipment, and biotech. So a lot of areas that have done exceptionally well in that 12-month period. So if we end up going, however, deeper into recession and uh, we find that this bear market ends up lasting a lot longer uh, and pretty much negating uh, the historical pattern of that 12-month period doing well, well, then I would tend to say that uh, it's the defensive sectors that are likely to continue to outperform because the demand for the products and services remain fairly static for food, beverage, tobacco, healthcare, and utilities. Great. That's an, uh, you know, a lot of conversation in terms of any equity market rally. Uh, is it a bear market rally? Uh, this was certainly top of mind during the summer, but even most recently, um, put put this, the bear market rally question and the midterm elections into the context of of what you do at Lowry Research. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I think when it when it comes to identifying uh, bear market rallies, I mean, you could use the June through August period as kind of an example. And while we we noted the potential for a counter trend rally. You know, there was elements of, of being oversold. There were there were some problems with it. And, um, you know, not the least of which was, you know, some of that evidence I talked to about major market bottoms, what's typically present historically. Again, we've got records back to 1938. Um, so we've studied these, you know, all these bottoms. And I think that's the real advantage and being able to discern because one of the most difficult things is actually discerning between the real bottom and a bear market bottom or a bear market rally rather because you know bear market rallies if you think about it the uh the rallies are meant to look and feel the part so they're, they're trying to you know that that is trying that ma that market action is trying to drag more people in before the next leg down and um and that's why you know true to what we do we look below the surface of price um and our our index our indicators are focused that way and um, and they can see when things don't look quite right under the surface and that's why we talk about breath we talk about you know buying power and selling pressure some of these things that you just you know you can't see when you're looking at the major price indexes that just look like they're going up and up and up um, you know that that's one of the things that we really kind of pride ourselves on is being able to take that step deeper and not get you know, not get pulled in or off sides in those in those situations, at least not from a from a longer term standpoint. And you know, again, it comes down to how tactical are you as far as wanting to play those things with uh, with the wind sort of in your face and swimming against the tide. So going back a year ago, so I think it was about September October of last year, you were spot on looking at kind of cracks in the bull market and pointing to uh, either breadth or small cap. 
fast forward to today, looking out, uh, what are some of the um, early signs um, that could be, you know, constructed for maybe the next bull market? I mean, what what would be the key areas that we should be watching from you? Yeah, I mean, one one of the things that um, you know we often talk about is, you know, a this idea of um, you know capitulation or you know, evidence of oversold, and we've got a few different indicators that help us with that. Um, but also that, you know, when, when do stocks actually kind of stabilize and when do they start, when do they start rising um, in their individual numbers, right? So in other words, if I'm not, if I'm just looking at the price index, it's hard to see that. But again, if I'm looking at breath and those things behind, what you'll often see is that um, you'll have big groups of stocks that may not have an additional low. So in other words, they may have some sort of a climactic low months. Uh, before the, the low is in. And I think that a really good example that anybody can relate to is um, back in late 2008 when there was a major you know, crash low, but didn't end up being the low. There was another low, of course, the final low of that market, that bear market was in March. But if you look at many of the stocks that you can kind of put into, a, I guess, a technology or a growth bucket, you know, they actually bottomed and uh, in on that first major low in in late uh, late 2008. So so some of it's just me looking at breath, and we want to see, you know, oftentimes small caps do lead in some way or certain big parts of the market. In that case, it was growth. Um, maybe it'll be different this time. Maybe it'll be value this time, or maybe it'll be a different group of stocks. Um, but the point is, you want some evidence that some area of the market is starting to find some stability. And that will be your next leadership area in the next bull market. So there are going to be clues. We just need to be able to identify them. And again, mostly through working with breath and, and some of our momentum indicators that will show not only the washout, but the recovery from the washout being in its nascent stage, but, uh, but, but to a point where it's probably powerful enough that you would see an, an extension. And we have um, different signals that will, will kind of get to that point of, okay, are we reaching some kind of escape velocity here? We have enough demand um, off of that capitulatory level that would suggest, you know, new bull market. Yeah. So, so last question, Sam, and mentioned mentioned market leadership, and and uh, you're you're a, a stu student of the stock market history. Does leadership change again? You know, when we go from bear to bull market, and you know, when we look back to the dot-com bust or even the nifty 50 decades ago, uh, could it be expected that, and then we had the FANG stock. So um, just what's your gut? Do, we, do you get a change of leadership in the high profile names as we go to the next bull market? Absolutely. Um, if you look to declines of 15% or more, uh, going back to 1990, which is as far back as S&P has sector level data, as well as sub industry level data, <clears throat> the sectors that lost the most during that 15 plus percent decline, if you um, took the, the top three sectors, the top 10 sub industries in terms of, you know, or maybe I should say the, the worst three sectors, the worst 10 sub industries, they tended to outperform on average uh, in the 12 months after the beginning of a new market advance. Uh, so those groups like consumer discretionary, like technology, like real estate, which have really taken it on the chin, um, as on the whole, uh, as an average, tend to outperform the market about 80 plus percent of the time. And when you look to the 10 sub-industries, uh, they have actually outperformed in each of the observations, so 100% of the time. Obviously not a guarantee, but simply an interesting look back. Conversely, the sectors that held up the best during that bear market or deep correction decline and uh, tended to underperform whether you were looking at sectors or sub-industries in the first 12 months of a new market advance. So uh, basically what you see is those that were worst become first. Um, and typically it's because there was a vacuum of opportunity and valuations 
that the more tactical investors try to fill. Great. We certainly could do another hour just of discussions here, but Dawn, if we can go to the next slide. I want to thank uh, all the attendees for joining us today, and uh, certainly each of our presenters, uh, Sam, Joe, and Vincent, for their time in sharing their views for the midterm elections and uh, also the, the equity market. And certainly you can see here um, that you can get more of our research um, from each of them, uh, from Market Scope Advisor, Lowry Research, and Washington Analysis. Um, and we certainly appreciate you, you taking your valuable time to be with us today. Uh, and we look forward to the next time to talk. Thank you again.